Hi, I'm John Fakara. Welcome to Fakara Classic. And today we begin my series on my cannonball adventures, beginning with the 2007 running of the 2904. Now, I'm going to use a bunch of phrasing about cannonballing and the 2904, but if you don't know what those things are, a quick history. Uh, cannonballing essentially has become a verb for driving from one side of the country to the other nonstop, coast to coast. Now, that's the key nonstop. If you're driving your Lamborghini or whatever fancy car and you're stopping every night to have parties, that's not cannonballing. You have to drive nonstop, coast to coast. Now, there's the Cannonball Baker or the Cannonball Baker Sea to Shining Sea Memorial Trophy Dash. And that was the original Cannonball from 1971 to 1979, set up by the legendary Brock Yates. And that became what was known as The Cannonball Run when it came out as a movie in 1981 with Burt Reynolds and Dom DeLuise and Farrah Fawcett. People come to cannonballing either through the writings of Brock Yates and his fantastic book, Cannonball. This is required reading. You need to get a copy of this if you're gonna get into cannonballing. It's amazing because The Cannonball Run seems like a silly movie until you read this and you find out that a lot of what happens in the film is really happened in real life. There were guys dressed as priests. There was a stock car. There was all kinds of shenanigans. But that's a whole nother video we'll do on the original Cannonball. So if you came through it through the Cannonball Run movie, which I did, I watched it as a kid, I thought it was amazing. You had these kind of images of zany adventures driving coast to coast and maybe having a fight with Jackie Chan. What drove me to Cannonball was, I was, it was 2007 and I was reading a bunch of different things at the time and they all kind of gelled together. Um, one was the Cannonball book. Another was an article on Alex Roy's 2006 record run from coast to coast where he kind of relit the Cannonball candle and I was like, huh. And if you don't know about that story, that's, you look into Alex Roy, but it was a single car running across the country, super prepped, weapons grade stuff on the dashboard, spotter planes. He spent a fortune doing it. And I was reading the book about the original run and I'm like, it's not really cannonballing, is it? I mean, not that I'm one to judge at that time. I was like, it didn't strike me as being really that cool. I was also reading an article on the 24 Hours of Lemons, which is, if you don't know, a racing series for $500 cars and it had just started at the Altamont Raceway in California and they had just gotten going and I thought, that's brilliant. Like trying to do 80% of real racing with a $500 car. And I was like, what if you drove across the country, you did a cannonball, but for like a lemons budget. Now I don't think you could do it for $500. So I really started thinking about it. I'm like, I want a cannonball and I don't have Alex Roy's money and resources. I wonder if I could do 80% of what Alex Roy did for like what he spends on scarves and sunglasses every year. So I was like, hmm. And I came up with the 2904. Essentially what it is, is 2,904 miles from New York to San Francisco. Now the original Cannonball went to Redondo Beach to the Portofino Inn. I'm not big on Southern California, so I wanted to go where I used to live in San Francisco. I knew it better and I had buddies there. So I'm like, let's drive to San Francisco. 2,904 miles. So I figured that'll be the budget. You can spend $2,904 on the car, fuel, tolls, tickets, everything. It has to be in that. And if you go over that amount, every dollar you go over, is a one minute penalty. So 60 bucks and you're an hour out. So you can't go over that number essentially. I was like, that's totally possible. You could go on Craigslist and get a cheap car that may or may not make it across the United States. And uh, I put out the call to a few friends. I'm like, I've got this crazy idea. And you know, it's always like 10 or 12 people are like, I'll totally do it. And then it always ends up being, you know, half of that. And the first person I called was my friend Pierce Plam, who is my best friend since high school. He said that he had to advise me that this was a really bad idea, followed by, he's totally in. Um, and that's a good friend right there, supports you in your crazy ideas. So he was ready on board. Uh, my business partner at Creative Film Cars was on board and uh, he had his girlfriend put together a team of all female drivers. And I thought, this is going to be great. We had at least three cars. 
Now my car, originally, I was planning on driving this 1974 Miller Meteor hearse that we had used in our film car company for a promotion for the family guy. And I had driven it to Chicago and back at like 90 miles an hour and nobody bothered me. And it was like, just you could just fly through in a hearse. I'm like, well, this is perfect. I even bought a 200 gallon marine fuel bladder that I figured we could put inside of a coffin in the back and then <laughs> have it hidden back there. And we could have two guys driving in suits and somebody you know, sleep next door to the, the coffin in the back. Uh, I mean, really insane, but I thought that might be a lot of fun. Unfortunately, we had to sell the hearse before the run and uh, I couldn't use that. But, you know, it, it would have worked great because no one's gonna bother a hearse. I even had a thought of making it a military hearse, but that I think was one step too far. And uh, even I have my limits. So I ended up using my street car. Now, if you live in New York, you either spend $500 or more a month putting a good car in a garage or you have a street car, like something you don't mind getting hit by a snowplow. And mine was a 1994 Subaru Loyal station wagon with 4x4. And it was great for the winters and it was partially rusty and it, it was fine, but it had kind of reached the end of its life. I figured, well, let's drive it out to the coast and donate it when we get there. It was a station wagon, which is important because I thought it would be really important to be able to sleep while we went. And we put together a team of three drivers. It was me, my business partner, and Alex Richter, who would go on to do a bunch of cannonballs with me, the Kung Fu genius. And the three of us ran in that car, and then Pierce showed up in Connecticut, bought a 1991, I think? No, no, 1992 Volvo 740 station wagon from his cousin for $1,000, and brought that down. And then my business partner's girlfriend, she and her friends, and Karina, who's Karina's amazing, she ended up running in other later runs. She's fantastic. Anyway, the three of them got her car that they had on their street car for when they lived up in Harlem. And that was a 1991 Subaru Loyal, another Loyal uh, sedan that they had bought for literally a stack of $10 bills up in Maine. And it was rusty as hell. I mean, <laughs> it was bad. They called it the wood burner. It was, it was a dreadful car. It looked great, but dreadful. And so we had these three cars. So we got the three cars and I'm like, all right, where do we start? And I didn't want to start at the Red Ball Garage, which is the traditional start in Manhattan for the Cannonball. And I didn't want to start in Connecticut, which was the last Cannonball in 79, because I didn't want, I didn't think I had the right to copy the Cannonball. So this was my own Cannonball. So we started from a small garage in Brooklyn, right off the BQE. We'll get the timestamp like they did back in the day and head off the BQE and drive across the country. Now, Cannonballing usually involves a lot of planning. Now, if you look at Alex Roy's book or you look at the book that Ed Bolian wrote, you can see all the planning they put into this. I mean, they had every step of the way, gas stations, everything planned out. We had nothing planned out. I mean, literally the prep for the car involved uh, tune-up, oil change. We put a couple of crappy, like $15 fog lights on the front. Uh, we had an old Garmin on the dash, and that was it. I mean, I think we piped the tires up a little higher so they were harder. I mean, really, <laughs> that was our entire prep. We didn't look at routes. We figured the Garmin would show us. We were going to take 80 all the way across. Uh, we had no, like, weapons grade anything. We just had the Garmin. So there was no radar detector. We didn't have any kind of, like, scanning for planes. Again, remember, this is 2007. So... Really, there wasn't a lot of that technology available back then. Literally, just a car and a Garmin and driving. The first car sets off, and that was Pierce in the station wagon. And we follow, and this is how poor our planning was. We didn't even look up if there was anything going on in Manhattan at the time, because you have to cross from Brooklyn into Manhattan and then head off into New Jersey. Uh, well, there was something happening. There was a big dragon parade down in Chinatown that bled over Canal Street, which is the cross over the bottom of Manhattan. And we got totally stuck in it. All the cars got stuck in it. We're just kind of sitting there like our big glorious start. We take off and then mm, sit <laughs> in traffic. We eventually made it across. We got through the Holland Tunnel. We get into Jersey. Then you go Delaware and Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania is when it first struck us that a couple of things. One is, we're driving across the country, we're not turning back. We're committed now. 
Uh, second is how slow the Subaru was. Both the Subarus had 90 horsepower when they were new, and I guarantee you didn't have them, still had 90 horsepower. The Volvo was dominant with 114 horsepower. So we're climbing the hills, the rolling hills of Pennsylvania, and we're <laughs> slowing down and going faster. We're like, oh man. And then we didn't have a spare tank. It was just just driving, like literally, we just drove. I wish there was some kind of crazy story that I could tell, but we literally just started driving across the country. And we found out about halfway across that we could barely, we were just breaking the speed limit most of the time. And the speed limit is, you know, 65 at the lowest, 80 at the highest. So when we got to the 80 states, we couldn't even break the speed limit. Surprisingly though, somewhere in Iowa, I think, we did get a speeding ticket. On the rare occasion, I think we were going downhill. It was, the, it was just morning and the sun was just rising and we got pulled over. And I think the cop was like really curious why there was a car with New York plates, you know, wheezing across the country with guys sleeping in the back of it. We still got the ticket. One of the few tickets, I didn't get a ticket, but one of the few tickets that were gotten um, during the 2904 run. And we took off. Now, here's something I learned very quickly was how to draft off of large trucks. Because again, we were literally, the car was floored the minute we got on the freeway from Iowa to Nevada. Like it was like four or five states that that car just, you just put your foot on the floor, no cruise control, you just put your foot on the floor and however fast it would go was however fast it would go. And we'd get behind trucks that were doing like 80 and would they just suck us up the hills, hopefully, and down again. So we were like leeching off of trucks. We're trying to find any speed that we can. And then we also realized on fuel stops, and we had used about a quart of oil going across, about halfway across the US. As soon as we started getting up in altitude into the high plains, it was a quart of oil every fuel stop. And then at one fuel stop, two quarts of oil. And the car only holds four quarts of oil. So we're like, where's the oil going? No smoke's coming out of the back. There's no oil in the exhaust pipe. There's no leak underneath the car. There's no spray inside the engine bay. We're like, where's the oil going? The only theory we came up with later was that the high altitude and low pressure, that it was coming out of the block, out of the EGR valve. Like it was literally just evaporating out of the engine. We are still to this day, no idea where all that oil went. We went through 14 quarts of oil. We eventually just started buying <laughs> like four at a time so we'd have some ready to go. And if the car blew up, the car blew up. But it, it, I mean, it ran pretty flawlessly for you know an old Japanese car with 200 and something thousand miles on it. I think the wood burner had almost 300,000 miles on it. And the Volvo was well up there as well. So we get across, now this is something that we learned and that if you ever cannonball, you will learn that at the 24 hour, 30 hour mark, things get weird and you start laughing at just about anything and time starts dilating and you're not sure what's going on because you, you've slept for four hours and it's the continual thrum of the engine. And by the time we got to Nevada, a couple of things happened. One was, we didn't really bring any real food with us. Like we did no preparation. I think it was like Costco trail mix and a couple of waters and whatever we could grab on the way. And the, uh, <laughs> we're driving across Nevada and my business partner, he's got uh, like beef jerky that we've bought and these dried cherries of some sort or something, or they were, I don't know what pickled cherries, they were disgusting. And he's wrapping them up in the beef jerky and passing them around the car and it looked like it was hors d'oeuvres. And we're like, that makes total sense. <laughs> Alex is in the back sleeping and he wakes up and he's like all out of it and we're feeding him cherries with beef jerky and it's just disgusting. And then there's a thermal vent area in Nevada and we pass by there and there's a long train line that goes right next to it. And I look over, I'm driving and I look over, I'm like, and I think this is our second, going into our second day. Your brain is just mush at that point. I look over, I can't even get the word train out of my mouth. I look over and I go, choo-choo. <laughs> like you reverted literally to a six-year-old by the time you've gotten that far. And, or maybe you're a six-year-old for even considering doing a cannonball. I'm not sure which is first. But we got into California, rolled down, Pierce had already finished. And we pretty much knew at that point that he had beaten us, but not by a lot, but he had beaten us. And the wood burners way back, the, the team was called the tailpipes. 
and in some weird moment of irony, their tailpipe, their rusted tailpipe, literally just fell off somewhere in Nebraska. All right, ladies, why don't you tell me what's going on right now? Our muffler fell off. The tailpipes now officially have, don't have no muffler. We have no tailpipe. We have no tailpipe. The tailpipe, we're tailpipeless. We have no tailpipe. They apparently got a couple more miles an hour out of that, so maybe we should have cut our muffler off too. Who knows? But we safely made it to San Francisco. All the teams made it. We got in, we finished at my friend's car dealership at Classic Cars West in the Mission in San Francisco. And our families came out and we started the tradition of going to this great burrito place in Glen Park called La Corneta. And they make this burrito, a California burrito. Now, if you've lived in New York for too long, you realize you can't get a real decent burrito there. And we just sat there like, uh, <laughs> our first real meal stationary in two, literally two days and just gobbling down these burritos. We would do that every 29 or four afterwards. And we had a party that night at Classic Cars West. They we showed off the cars, lots of people came. It was a lot of fun. And I thought, great, I've accomplished my goal. I've cannonballed. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I understand the urge and the application and the execution now. So I thought that would be it. Honestly, I thought we did one, but no, apparently not. Apparently Top Gear magazine heard about it through a few friends and they got interested in the idea and called up. And so I had to organize another The 2904 in 2008. I would do things a lot differently for that race. A lot different car, a lot different preparation, a lot more serious and a lot more silly, but that's the next video. But before we go, I want to give you the rundown for the cars on the 2904. The first place car was Flying Hellfish. That was Pierce's team. In their 1992 Volvo 740, they finished in 37 hours, 54 minutes. They consumed 131 gallons of fuel. They spent total $1,778, car, tolls, tickets, everything. Average speed, 76.6 miles an hour. Second place. Team Creative Film Cars, that was me. In our 1994 Subaru Loyal station wagon, and we did that in 40 hours, eight minutes. We used 136 gallons of fuel. We spent $1,748, again, car, tolls, tickets, everything, and we averaged 72.4 miles an hour. And that was a hard earned 72 mile an hour average, I tell you. Third place came the Tailpipes in their 1991 Subaru Loyale. They finished in 46 hours and 41 minutes. Bless them. Uh, 129 gallons of fuel, and they spent a total of $826.99, including the car, and averaged 62.2 miles an hour. The trophy that would end up being awarded was part of one of the Subarus. It was the hubcap from one of the Subarus that we made up and gave to the winning team. The winning team had to put their key and glue it to it, and then we wrote their names and times on it. Now, that trophy I thought would be it, but it became a perpetual trophy. So now it has the keys and times of all the cars that competed in all eight the 2904s over the years. And if you watch VinWiki, which I hope you do, You'll see it in the background in the studio, right behind people's shoulders. You'll see the, the trophy with the 2904. It's gotten a lot bigger and fancier over the years because everybody who won had to add something to it. It is retired, it is done. There's no more of the 2904s, but you can see the trophy back there. So that's the story of my first cannonball, the 2904 of 2007. If you've enjoyed these videos, please like and subscribe. I'll be doing more for you. There'll be more of the cannonball videos, more of the history videos all coming up. And I appreciate you watching. I appreciate you being part of my community. Have a great day.